It's now more than five years since the British government stepped in to rescue RBS from total ruin and prevent the potential complete collapse of the economy. For the first time, someone has brought together everything that happened at RBS right from the start. From when it was initially founded as a humble Scottish bank in 1727, to its near death in 2008 as a sickly monster bloated by greed. That person is journalist and author Ian Martin and his book, which features testimony from almost all the key players both before and after its rescue, is called Making It Happen, Fred Goodwin, RBS and the Men Who Blew Up the British Economy. Ian came into IB Times UK's Canary Wharf office to speak with us about his book. Hi Ian, thanks very much for coming in. In your book on the subject of political interference, um, you give the backstory of Stephen Hester, the former, or the soon-to-be former RBS chief executive, who um, the Treasury were at pains to say George Osborne wasn't pushing out, but you kind of give the suggestion that actually maybe he was pushed out because he didn't quite agree with all of Osborne's reforms. So does that worry you that there appears to have been this political interference, even though taxpayers do own, obviously, yeah. a huge chunk of RBS, that there, there seems to be that pushing hand from the Treasury? And it worries me greatly because I mean, five years ago when the crisis happened, my con principal concern as someone who's a believer in free markets, my principal concern, while I could understand the need for the rescue because the cash machines were about to stop working, uh, my concern was that we were, getting in, we were going to get ourselves into a situation that was going to be very difficult to get out of and that gradually you'd get this creeping corporatism uh, and that politicians just couldn't help themselves really and eventually they would seek to exert control. Um, over organisations that would be far better run commercially in the private sector. I think what happened with Hester, uh, he was forced out, effectively. Um, as I say in the book, it's not as though George Osborne leaned across the, the, the table, Alan Sugar style, and said, you're fired. That's not how it worked, and that's not really ha how the city works um, either. But there was, from the end of uh, last year, there was a... There was a a split an argument uh, on the strategy for RBS and Hester took one view which was that RBS should continue to be a large international bank with lots of activities abroad and that it should still do some investment banking and that it should be a, a serious universal bank uh, on a global scale and the government took the view rightly or wrongly that that's not what they wanted, that they wanted RBS to become another Lloyd's. So they wanted it to become very much, almost exclusively focused on the UK, much smaller, without global uh, ambitions. There's a whole debate to be had about who's right there, but there's no doubt that that, having become the government's view, they attempted to force that on Hester, and it got very messy with the board, some members of the board of RBS feeling appalled that Hester was being forced out. Others determined or convinced that there was no way to avoid the government getting its way. And um, so it was a very messy uh, unravelling. And I think Hester, who um, not everything Hester did was, um, was spot on, but um, I think he deserves a lot of credit for, as he puts it uh, in the book, diffusing the time bomb. Um, RBS's balance sheet by the time of the crisis was £1.9 trillion. It was bigger than the UK economy uh, by, that, um, by that measure. And he took a trillion pounds out of the balance sheet uh, and, as he says, diffused the, diffused the time bomb. And I think having done that, he was then rather shabbily treated by the Treasury. He must be pretty happy to be shot of RBS now. I mean, that must be a big relief. I mean, it's, obviously, it's never going to be good to, to leave a, a job that you're doing not necessarily by your choice, but I mean, that must have been a big burden to carry as the chief I think executive he's, of RBS. I, he's, Stephen Hester, I think, is delighted to be away from RBS. Um, the impression, impression I get is regrets about leaving some of the people um, and quite a bit of pride about people that he worked with and for, uh, worked with, but um, he didn't really like dealing with the media, that was clear. Um, and uh, he now will be able to go off and have a very long rest, uh, look for another job where he's not going to get half of the attention that he's had. He's been right in the spotlight, and I think someone who's not particularly comfortable with being in that position, I think he's very, very pleased indeed. And he'll be paid more as well, I assume, probably. 
I suspect so. He'll now, yes, he'll now go off and uh, probably double his income and get a lot less attention. Sounds like a good deal. <laughs> it does. Um, you also mentioned in the book that um, the Treasury and Osborne are scared that there might be some more horrors to come on the balance sheet. And obviously, since the crisis, we've had a lot come out of RBS, not just RBS, but certainly they've been big players in things like PPI. Um, libel fixing, we've had uh, derivatives mis-selling. Did you get any hints at what there might still be lurking or, or do you think the job is pretty much done, it's just a case of reducing the size of the balance sheet now? Well, I think Hester uh, and his team uh, completely deny and I think quite resent the Treasury's um, claims on this. I mean, behind the scenes, w what happened when they started to get their wobble about RBS inside the Treasury and uh, UK FI and elsewhere late last year was they started to fear what the, the nightmare scenario became. What happened if they moved to sell off the first chunk of RBS and that RBS wasn't uh, fixed in the way that Hester had claimed? Uh, and they, the, the nightmare heading towards an election was Osborne selling a bit off and then having to rush back in and rescue RBS again if there were further problems that emerged or there was a, some external shock like some problem with the Chinese economy or the euro crisis came back. Now as I say, I stress, Hester denies that that's, denies that that's the case but the, the government's estimates and the government's advisors started to think, well look, if there's about 60 billion of non-core um, Actually, it's probably it's, it's kind of be down below 40 soon um, as it runs off. If they're out by 10% in terms of their estimates on it, that's a six billion six billion hole in RBS. Um, as I say, Hester cont Hester contests that, but they but the Treasury found themselves thinking in terms of nightmare scenarios. So at that point, this spring the idea of get moving to good bank, bad bank, suddenly came back into fashion. And Mervyn King, um, Mervyn King had been determined to try and get it back on the table before he left uh, as governor, retired and was replaced by Mark Carney. So it, it suddenly in government circles, they were prepared to think about this again. And of course then hired uh, Rothschild to uh, to do a study on the practicalities of good bank, bad bank for RBS. Not straightforward at all, very difficult to unpick um, and would obviously delay the government's timetable in terms of selling off a chunk of, R uh, of RBS. Uh, but they were sufficiently worried uh, and determined not to get into that nightmare scenario that I described that they have gone through this process, which will which we'll all know the answer to within the next couple of weeks they'll decide whether RBS is being split up or not.